Welcome to tonight's Selectman's meeting for July 7th, 2020. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast live and taped by NCM. And we'll begin tonight's meeting as usual with a salute to the flag and a moment of silent reflection. <coughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, United States. and to the republic to for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible. liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, tonight, tonight's meeting is uh, planned to be relatively short. The manager uh, has a program he'd like us to give further consideration to. And uh, last meeting, we uh, supported it, but he's looking to possibly add some additional funds. And if we're going to support that, it seemed important that we do it in a timely manner. Uh, so we'll make a decision once we hear from the manager, Mr. Mizuko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the board's aware, last week we approved an emergency uh, homeowner assistance program related to the June 28th storm. We believe we've identified an additional half a million dollars in funding that we could add to the program if the board and their capacities like commissioners so chose to. Uh, it basically is our light department excess receipts, the money at the end of the year that would otherwise become free cash. It is your purview if you so choose to uh, formally turn that over to the town for whatever program you designate. Uh, the staff recommend you do at this point. Uh, in brief, damage applications and inquiries continue to come in. We're estimating residential damage at around a million and a half dollars, if not more, and that's just what's come in. There are a number of businesses and nonprofit organizations that have been heavily impacted as well. We have some damage estimates where some folks are only submitting seven or eight hundred dollars. We have many that are in the twenty-five, thirty-five, and above thousand dollar damage. So there is a substantial amount of residential damage out there, and we're just looking to do what we can do for our residents given the extreme circumstances. It was an awful storm coming on top of a pandemic, coming on top of the loss temporary of the hospital, as well as a currently 16% unemployment rate in town. We would like the board's authority to go ahead and add those funds to the mix and uh, continue on with our program. That being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions the board has. Question, Mrs. Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Manager, would you please be so kind to describe how, how much in funds you have presently and what sources the funds are currently being derived from? So what the board approved last week was using two remaindered grant funding sources from prior years. One was CDBG program money and one was design Lawyer, money. Please. Sorry, I, he's talking too fast. Sure. What program? Community Development Block Grant Program Income, which is money the town receives for administering Community Development Block Grant programs. And you're able to use that for community development related functions. And then the other was remaining design money from a project several years ago we received from the Department of Conservation and Recreation that has no other use. That project is not going forward. So we've spoken with the state and we've used authority under the Civil Defense Act to reallocate those funds, which gives us about $180,000 start with so that's next what the question board right next question how many applications have you received to date so the formal grant applications that have come in we've received about 22 grant applications to date we've received over 250 emails with information in the emails come in first and they have to get converted to the grant some folks will need a little bit of time to get their tax information as well as some receipts and their insurance denial uh, we've encouraged everyone to apply as soon as possible, but it's better to apply once they have those documents ready. Um, we're aware of quite a few folks at the senior center is helping get their applications together because there is a little bit of paperwork. We've tried to make it as painless as possible, but um, there are some forms and everything that folks need to get together to formally put the application in. But uh, in terms uh, of income for damage, it's over 250 so far, and that's actually the close of business yesterday's inquiry. We've gotten more today. Of the 25 that are in, how yep. many are residential and how many are commercial? Uh, most of those are residential. We've told commercial businesses that they can go ahead and submit a grant. They'd be considered in the third tier, which means there may not be any money left after we take care of residents because we're focusing on hab habitability of the homes. What is the amount of the, the limit of the grant per individual? $5,000 is the limit. 
if we were able to get some rebates from another source, we may look at adding to that, but we're trying to spread the money out. Um, that'll take care of some people entirely, and that will not take care of even 10% of some people's damage. I mean, we have some homes that have $70,000 worth of damage. And to be clear, it's a reimbursable grant program. So it's not just you get money, you have to show that your expenses were at that amount. If somebody has $1,200 in expenses, and we do have some smaller inquiries where it was an $800 repair or a $1,500 repair, that's all that they're getting, but it's a reimbursable program. So the money needs to be expended. <clears throat> On an extreme case-by-case -case basis, if somebody was very low income, we might work with them in a vendor, but that's a, a more detailed uh, review process. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments on the manager's recommendation? Mr. Hajar. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Tony, I, I presume that based on what you're describing is that we are not validating whether individuals, whether businesses or residential homes are being compensated through insurance. We're just basically taking what the individual submits. I know it's reimbursable, but if someone doesn't want to go through their insurance because they don't want to make a claim and they're able to for three pieces of appliances and get $5,000, is that how it would be dealt with? No, That's so there's, there's there's a there's a not to exceed on the appliances. So we're not buying everyone everything that they want, and that goes through that. It focuses on the habitability of the home and what's required for habitability. And we are requesting a denial of insurance um, from anyone that applies, so that way they've contacted their insurance. Now, some of the smaller uh, applications, it might be that we've had an eight hundred dollar uh, repair that they're not likely to submit to insurance anyway, but. Um, anything larger, we're asking for that denial, assuming insurance denies it, or proof that insurance has paid a claim, I guess would be the other way to work on it. But we know that insurance is not approving a lot of these claims. Well, my fault is that you're asking for another 500. So we're asking that as a local community that we commit $680,000 to private individuals or up to $608,000 to private individuals I have my concerns about the, uh, I mean, I'm all for providing assistance, put it this way. I, I know people went through tough times w w with jobs as it is. Um, but what we consider right now a real problem, someone else in another year on something else that may occur may also consider that just as equal. And I'm I'm really concerned that we're committing uh, or asking them to commit $680,000. I'm for providing uh, additional assistance. I, I would not approve five hundred thousand. Um, you know, we're meeting every two weeks, and, and the chairman has a right to call uh, executive meetings to deal with additional emergencies as as we go. Um, so I, I'm real concerned about that number. My my third point is, you said that the the dollars uh, generated by the light department it's excess if we don't put it in this fund, it would go to free cash. Correct. Is there a third alternative that says uh, we're allowed to put additional excess money into uh, the fund for rate stabilization? I know we put in 500,000, but why aren't we trying to enhance that even more since this is all excess dollars? Sure. So we always generate some money from the light department for free cash, and we always want to continue that. If we completely didn't have any of that transfer over to the treasury every year, it would really, really hurt our free cash. We had what you could describe as a good year at the light department. It go, that number goes up and down. The light department profit mm -hmm. number, it's in the budget book that goes to town meeting. It's been as low as $2 million. It's been as high as $6 million. It floats around the $4 million mark. So if we transferred everything somewhere else, that would really hit our free cash. So that's why we picked the number that we felt we still need some money to flow to free cash. And uh, in terms of the total amount, we're looking at our estimates are anywhere between a million and a half upwards of $3 million of residential damage. So it's quite substantial. So we're just trying to take the sting out of uh, as many residents as we can. And remember that the program is first income controlled. So the first tier is focusing on folks whose combined family income is 80% or less of the area median income. Then it goes between 80 and 150% of the AMI and then tier three is where we're considering either businesses, nonprofits, or anyone over that. We may never even get to that level. The board has not right. hey, Sorry, go ahead. I was just wanting a clarification on the free cash issue because I, I know what you're saying, but if we put $500,000 into this fund, 
There is no free cash money with respect to this part. If we put $500,000 in the rate stabilization fund, there is no free cash for this part of 500,000 that we're talking about. Isn't there a better balance is my, my concern. I, I, I am real concerned that we're really going to put $680,000 uh, into a, a program that you're saying is upwards of 1.5 million. Um, that, that's a lot for a community to give up. It, it really is. And I'm all for helping. I agreed with the 180 um, in agreement that we should do a little bit more, but 500,000, it's, um, that's a, that's a tough one to say to the ratepayers and taxpayers that this was the absolute only thing that we should be doing. Ms. Maloney, did I see your hand, sir? I'll wait till the others have spoken, Mr. Chairman. It's okay. Mrs. Donahue, Mr. Lane have their hands up. All right, Mr. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mazzucco, in your opinion, is this the fastest way to get money to homeowners who have been affected? Correct. If this had happened at a different, on the one hand, if this had happened in a different part of the fiscal year, our options would be more limited. We'd have to have the board authorize deficit spending and then hope town meeting gives us the, uh, makes that up down the end. <coughs> That's the less ideal option. In terms of getting money to folks quickly, I don't know if we're going to see a dollar from the state or the federal government. So they can file for insurance, but there's a lot of people who got hit with twenty or thirty thousand dollar bills. And remember, flooding happens. You know, storm drains become overloaded. This has happened before; it will happen again. We're looking at it in the context of a pandemic where we currently have a local unemployment rate of sixteen percent, and that does not count the hospital job loss. Out of the fourteen hundred jobs at the hospital, we can ex we can assume at least. From what we're hearing, roughly half of them will be probably gone, uh, at least on the short term. So it's also a matter of time where there's a little bit more suffering in the community than there is if it had just been a storm, if we hadn't lost uh, the hospital. At least that's my perspective. It's ultimately up to the board and their capacity. But in terms of quick uh, speed, we are getting applications in. We're going to start the review process in the next couple of days and would like to start being able to get some of this aid out to people as early as late next week. Thank you. This is Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mizuko, if we didn't put, if, if we took the money and we put it in. The override stabilization, you might be able to, but remember that the free cash number, uh, we say free cash dies on June 30th. It's really July 15th when we close out our books. So the board can make that decision up till July 15th. After that, we no longer have any money to transfer to the life department so we know where we are next year. But it also, to follow up on Mrs. Dunning's question, if I understood it correctly, if we put this money into free cash, it's not going to have anything to do with this year's budget. Town meeting already voted, and we didn't vote to take any money out of uh, free cash to balance the budget. So it will be there in the savings, but it will not be used in any way for this year's budget, coming year's budget, or current my year's next, budget. My next question, my next question is, do we have the authority to, to pass over so much money to a small group of people as opposed to considering the entire residents of the town in Norwood? You do, you and we have I mean? Yeah, like we have we're, gonna buy, we're gonna buy people's washers and dryers, but I mean, and it's very bad that they lost their washers and dryers and things like that. But well, how about all the other people in town? So it's important to remember that any grant program always passes over a majority of people in any community. That's how they all work. So if we when we did we've done housing grants in the past, you get 10 or 15 units a year. When we do business grants, we've done sort of the signage grants and those you don't get everyone, you never do. What you're trying to target is those who have been affected and those who have the least means. It's similar to any other CDBG program uh, that's out there. And in terms we of have, the authority, we do. We have already $180,000. It would seem that we meet, we could meet every week, we could meet every two weeks. It would seem that we should see how we do here. If we give $500,000 more to it, then we're providing for more money so the third tier i think we should proceed slowly and see how things go check the need see who the money's going to make sure the money's going where it's needed the most 
$180,000 is a lot of money. Mr. Maloney? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me the last one did accept the principle of this extraordinary circumstance whereby we'll use available funds to help people with a very specific need in the wake of the flood uh, at this particular time in our history. So we've appropriated $185,000. It seems to me there are two questions. One, uh, Mr. Hajar indicated that he thought an additional half a million was too much. The question might be then, well, then how much would he be satisfied with taking from the light department or taking from any other source? Uh, and, and the second question really has to, uh, Mr. Mizuko, let's assume that we take the additional half a million dollars and we put it into the fund for this purpose and say 30 days from now or 60 or whatever the reasonable time frame is, we find out, well, we, you know, we, we, we helped out a whole bunch of people, we have some funds left over. I assume those funds, with those funds, the funds assigned from uh, the light department or taken from the, would they go back to the light department and just flow through? I assume they're going to flow through the free cash, right? What? So what, what you're doing is your capacity as light commissioners, you have the statutory authority to vote where your statutory excess goes. So you're voting to turn it over to the town for the use of this program or, you know, the, the direction of management. That, once that's there, once we're done with this program, we close it out. In most programs, it closes to free cash because you've already made that transfer. So it doesn't go back anywhere. It just becomes like any other grant program that we are closing out. It would go to free cash. I okay, believe so, so, I believe so the answer to the question though is, is Also, find some place to put it. If you don't receive as many applications as you expected, if the damage isn't as bad as we thought, or if you don't have as many people qualifying under this tier one, two, and three, and we don't use all the money, well, the money comes back to the town and it goes into the general fund via free cash eventually, even though we assigned it specifically from the light department to this purpose. If I get that right, Correct. We, we hit, you hit an end program on the grant where you say, well, we're done. We, we've taken applications, we've gone through the program, and we're done. And okay. it, closes up, and it closes to free cash. The only timeline issue we have is we have till July 15th to make any entries on our last fiscal year. Okay. So that's why, you know, if we were to say, well, let's do $100,000 and wait a month and see where we are, we don't have any money to appropriate in a month. All right. So then my question would be for my colleague, Mr. Hajar, is there, if, if you're, if you think 500,000 on top of the 185 is too much, do you have a number in mind? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, let me, before I uh, ask Mr. Hajar to answer your question on the process here, as I understand it, as light commissioners, we can transfer money for specific specific purpose, like the manager said, and that the way we would handle it would be just like other uh, donations that we get made. The light department will make a 4453A contribution to the town for this specific purpose. When you make that, you can let any balance flow to free cash because it was unspent for that purpose. Or you can say to spend these funds and any unspent balance for this purpose will be returned to the giver, to the light department. You can make that a condition of the gift. Mr. Hajar, Mr. Uh, Malone, he had a uh, question? Yes, he did. Um, and before I answer it, Tony, is it 180 or 185 that we authorized last week? I just want to. It's the combination of two grant funds. It changes a little bit each day because of the interest amount, $180,000. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I would propose that we use 320000 of the five hundred for this program, making it a half a million, and then put the other one hundred and uh, eighty thousand dollars into the rate stabilization fund. Is that in the form of a motion? Um, it, it, it is, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Is there a second to that? Hearing no second, Mrs. Donahue, you had a question, comment? Yes, please. Um, who processes the applications? Who determines? whether or not the application is a valid application. So it's, it's being handled by the manager's office. So who in your office is an insurance adjuster? Or who has the experience to handle well, claims? Hold on, to, be, to be clear, these are not insurance claims and people aren't filing claims. I mean, it's it's a grant program. What I'm, saying, what I'm saying is who, who has the experience on handling the claims? How to handle a claim? 
so, but you're, you're calling it a claim. It's not a claim. It's a grant program. And we're quite familiar with handling grant programs in terms of an insurance denial. Remember it's the manager's office that actually handles the entire town's insurance portfolio. So I don't think it's beyond our, within our skill set. I know that it's not insurance, but I'm just saying homeowners are one thing, but when it comes to a business, how do we determine whether or not XYZ company needs a hundred thousand dollars or $50,000? Well, the that limit is $5,000, so they're, they're only eligible for that as well. The, the companies are only eligible for $5,000 as well? Correct. It's a $5,000. Yeah, that's the limit we put on the program. We can't solve everyone's problems here, and we can't solve all of everyone's problems. We can take the sting out. If somebody does have a quarter of a million dollars worth of damage because they're a business, if there's funds left over after we've taken care of residents, and that's a big if, we're going to try to see where we can help them, but that may never be the case. We're not able to fix an entire building here. We're able to help take the sting out of this for the community that's been suffering for the last several months. In that case, I second Mr. Hijaz's motion. Um, I've already declared it, but I'll accept that. Uh, Maiden seconded Mr. Maloney. Well, just the one thing, I, 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 Mr. Hijaz, I think it, it's an interesting enough proposal. My, my, only, my only concern is I think we probably ought to deal with one issue first and the other second. I, I would prefer to decouple it. If, there's, if Mr. Hijaz thinks we should have 320,000, Allocate three hundred thousand for this purpose because it will satisfy the immediate need. That's fine. Maybe he's right. I'll go along with it. The rest of it, as for rate stabilization, I do think the time has come for us to have a more global conversation about how we work with the light department and the things that we do. And I know, Mr. Chairman, I've talked with you about it a little bit, Mr. Mazuko as well. Mm -hmm. Probably ought to this summer now that we have some budget uh, uh, analysis talent. Uh, in the organization, uh, take a look at what we do with the light department. We know that they recently were downgraded uh, by the bond rating agencies. This is all for another night, but I, I, I do think probably it's time to take a look at how they do debt service, how we do rate stabilization, and that's got to come from from the light commissioners, not not from um, on the ground there. I think it's really got to come from the head of the organization. But Mr. Jot thinks three twenty <laughs> plus the one will satisfy the need. Uh, I'll go along with that. I would just prefer to decouple those two questions. Um, that's uh, fine. I'll, I'll, amend my, I'll amend my motion if uh, a second will also agree that we allocate $320,000 of the Lake Department's um, excess uh, to 4453A as a donation to this program. Second. I, I agree with the second uh, the right. amendment. Well, very good. Thank you. I just want to pull up on uh, comments Mr. Maloney just made. There has been a uh, little brief discussions uh, I had with Ms. Maloney and I had a separate discussion with Mr. Uh, Mazuko also that uh, he has raised some different questions and points about the light department's financial uh, position, not only today, but going forward. We want to have a good review and analysis of what we're going to be doing going forward. So we're going to set up a, a special meeting just as light commissioners to total review this whole issue, probably be a few weeks out, but we're definitely gonna have this on our agenda, probably a separate night, as I said, as light commissioners to uh, digest this whole uh, topic. All right, anything further on the motion, which is now to approve a 4453A donation of these excess funds as identified by the manager uh, to this program. Is there anything further? Mr. Lane. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So uh, if this passes, we would appropriate 320,000 as opposed to 500,000. Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. All right, hearing none, seeing any other discussion, we'll put it to a vote uh, by roll call. Mr. Lane? No. Nay. No. Mr. Maloney? Aye. Mrs. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Haja? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so that will pass four to one with uh, Mr. Lane in opposition. Mr. Mazuko, can you give us a brief update on the storm conditions? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll go over a couple of items briefly that I mentioned last week and then focus on the hospital, I will be brief. Uh, just as everyone knows, and we had said this last week, but to be clear, the storm that we faced on the 28th, uh, there have been some comments out there about town pumps failing during the storm. There are no town pumps that failed or town pumps that exist to fail. So there was also talk of a water main break. There was no water main break. Uh, some of the rainfall was so heavy that it appeared that way as it came out of buildings, it flooded into buildings and flooded out. But there were no water main breaks. There were no pump failures. 
it was just an incredible amount of rain in a short period of time. Uh, one point that's worth making because it did come up, and I know the board is certainly aware of this, so this is really for uh, the audience at home. The stormwater and sewer systems are actually separate. Um, some folks see the water flowing over, they see it coming out, and they assume that it's sewer, but the storm drain system handles rainwater and runoff. The sewer system is a closed system that handles just sewer. So there was concerns about was there raw sewage flowing over different streets. That's all storm water. It's not to say that we didn't have a few sewer backups. That happens as a result of illicit discharges. Not to mention that much water going into the system is always going to permeate a little bit, but they're completely separate systems and the sewer system is a locked system. So when you saw water rushing down the street on uh, near Central Street, that's not sewage, that's just stormwater runoff. But some folks aren't aware that there are uh, different systems. Um, our storm system, for the most part, is designed to code, which is to handle a 10-year storm, which is about four and a half inches of rain in a 24-hour period. We had about 4.6 inches of rain in under an hour and a half. So even areas where we haven't made improvements that we've discussed, uh, yeah, that's my reaction. Um, there have been some proposals to improve the stormwater infrastructure over years, and I think that may be something we want to look at. We may want to look at a stormwater utility, which many communities are doing. That being said, the, that amount of rain in that short period of time, there is no stormwater system in the world that could ever handle that amount of rain in that short period of time. And we're very fortunate that the water table was as low as it is. Uh, the storm in 1998, we had about six inches of rain over a 24 hour period. That was, a fair, they had a condensed period there, but it was over a much, much longer period. Specific to the hospital, uh, we met with them today, Mr. Plasco and I did. Uh, Stewart is committed to the town. They're committed to rebuilding the hospital as needed. We're still looking at 45 to 60 days for the ER to be fully up and running. Uh, we'd hoped it was 30 to 45 days. There's quite a lot of work that needs to be done for some of those services related to it. Uh, that is going to cause longer response times for us and many other communities, as well as an increase in cost for transits. But they are going to get the ER up and running first. Um, as we know, we're anticipating employee furloughs and layoffs as a result of the hospital being sh closed short term. They are looking to move people to other places in the system as they can. Uh, and the hospital's been here for 100 years. They're committed to being here for another 100 years. We're going to discuss in the next few weeks and months about uh, whether there are any zoning changes needed to do, be, uh, needed to happen, because the hospital's looking at the best investment for their dollar, and they're still looking to invest in Norwood and invest in the hospital. And I think what will come out of this down the road, which will be a couple of years total, is going to be something better than we have now that'll keep us on the map and keep uh, our hospital here in the community and continue paying taxes and fees. But it's going to be a long process from here to when we can cut the ribbon, so to speak but they're committed and they're moving quickly and it's um, there'll be some a lot of work to come. I believe Mr. Plasco is gonna be working with the Economic Development Commission to see ways we can assist the hospital in the rebuilding process and see what assistance may be available from the state or the federal government in a variety of means to make sure that we can get them to uh, continue investing here, but they are committed to investing here and we may see some big changes at the hospital, but at this point it looks like it'll be a little bit of a long slog, but a positive one. And I believe that's all I have. Now, let's just yeah, ask if you want to uh, add something. No, that pretty much covers it. Um, you mentioned unemployment a couple of times tonight, and the, the hospital uh, has a potential of up to about a thousand people being unemployed, although they're trying to keep as many as possible employed in their other facilities. But we were told that over 350 have already filed for unemployment. So that number is going up each day, apparently. Yeah, and just one other point I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, unemployment in our workforce region is that it's 16% in Norwood, it's 12% over our region. So our region has the lowest rate in the state, but our community has 16%, which is about average. It's worse somewhere else. So we actually expect while that'll come down a little bit as uh, the economy begins to reopen, we'll see a local bump in that number. All right, if there isn't any specific questions on that update, well, Mr. Ja. Well, I just want to, um commend uh, Tony and Bill for meeting with the hospital and providing us with good news uh, earlier. This is this is good to hear that uh, a long long-standing organization, even though it not, might not have been Stewart 100 years ago, uh, the fact that we would have an operating hospital for a long period of time and their commitment to it says a lot about their feelings for this region and for the needs. Um, so I, I was really glad to to hear that and let's hope for the best for all the employees uh, and certainly the town can help out as far as getting them uh, up and, and building as soon as possible so that's good news so thank thank you both okay all right so we'll move on the next item on our agenda was a uh, request from Douglas Swingnet of the AFCCME local 1451 regarding request for an employment contract for the general manager 
recommend that we uh, take a motion to forward this to Labor Council for review and appropriate action. So moved. Is there anything Back. further? Mr. Back. Lane? Yep. Mr. Lane? Oh, no, seconded. Okay, it's seconded. I'm taking the vote. I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. I didn't hear you. So I broke up a little bit. Aye. Mr. Maloney? Aye. Uh, Mrs. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Ja? Mm -hmm. Aye. And the chair votes aye, so we'll forward that to council. That's actually all the formal business we were going to try to take up tonight. If there's any other uh, new business, now would be the time to uh, bring it up. Mrs. Donahue? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Monday, I had to go to Boston, and I was coming home on Center Street, in West Roxbury, near the VA hospital, stopped in traffic. Route 1 was in front of me, perpendicular. Siren comes along. Who goes past? The town of Norwood Ambulance. It moved my heart and to see how they're carrying on and taking care of those who are in in this you know emergency situation. I just wanted to say how beautiful it was. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Ja? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, earlier today, I sent you all uh, an email regarding uh, taxi service. And if we were all meeting together, I would have handed it out so that you could all uh, have it at the meeting. Um, so I sent it to you so that you could um, see uh, my concern as uh, addressed to me by um, individual seniors who have called or um, uh, emailed me, as well as uh, Kerry over at the senior center. <clears throat> so um, basically we have one licensed uh, taxi firm in the town, uh, Veterans Cab, um, who have been uh, out of out of business now for quite some time due to COVID, and according to Kerry, they they're saying that they're not even sure they're going to be able to come back and serve no wood going forward, which would leave us with zero licensed uh, taxi cab firms. I know that can be the business that that is, but uh, there are three other firms that I mentioned to you in the email: Angel Cab, Family Taxi, and The Right Ride, who uh, all are providing service to individuals in this town but none of the three are licensed so um I, I would like to pursue looking at this a little closer trying to find out why it is that they're not licensed or won't get licensed we have our own regulations uh, maybe they need to be updated I'd like to talk to the town council about what can be done about unlicensed vendors serving uh, patrons in this town um and then come back to the board with uh options, recommendations, whatever it is. But um, I, I think we owe it to our seniors to find out, you know, why uh, this is happening. And, you know, one of the primary issues is the vouchers that they use to get around. And Veterans is the only one, because they're the licensed one, only one to be provided vouchers and will accept them. Uh, the other three companies will not. Um, and so we need to address that as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, didn't you do an extensive study about this about five years ago? Yeah, we, we, ha we had to uh, give you a little history. Uh, we had very involved issues around some of our taxi providers in the past. Uh, police were always having difficulties receiving a lot of complaints. We had hearings. Uh, we took action on some of them, and one of them we suspended their license for six months uh, and so forth. Uh, my understanding, and it may not be correct, it's good if Mr. Jha is willing to uh, explore it a little further, is that most of the people or uh, companies who are getting their license from us so that they could get their taxi medallion, if you will, a license plate, so that they could go to Westwood train station and to Logan Airport without being harassed by the police uh, in those locations, and then they were doing very little to zero business in town. We had actually, Mrs. Fenny uh, alluded to, we had actually had every cab company supply an entire year's records of all their fares, so we could, and I analyzed whether they were out of town or local pickups and so forth, and there was very little uh, service actually going on to people in the town of Norwood regarding pickups. 
Um, any event, that kind of got quiet, and I think the reason was that Westwood did not that did not used to uh, license taxis decided they were having issues over on their property at the Westwood uh, train station on University Ave, and to tr they get that under control, they uh, started licensing, and I think the cab companies decided they weren't going to pay for two licenses in each town, and they just migrated over to, to Westwood. Now, I don't know if the firms you mentioned have done that or if they're, in fact, operating without a license. But I think to provide the service to the public, we need to look at it. Uh, the regulations do need to be updated, no doubt, if they're still going to have, ta in my opinion, if we're still going to have taxi uh, businesses in town. Also gets a little complicated with considering the taxi businesses uh, compared to today's Uber and Lyft and so forth. But um, I think we definitely have to spend some time figuring out uh, what the story is and what we can or cannot do with it. Mr. Hajar is uh, volunteering to uh, put in that work and I think we should support his endeavor. Mr. Maloney? Uh, your, your mic's off, Mr. Maloney. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> We're done with that topic, may I introduce one other? Sure. Um, I, I read through the uh, most recent uh, Standard & Poor's Global Ratings Comparison uh, this past weekend. It was issued on, uh, in early June of this year, and I did some comparison between 2019's report and 2020. I just, I think probably, and I talked to Mr. Mizuko about this briefly this evening too, it might be a good idea while we're taking a look at some of the global things, uh, that, you know, pertaining to our organization, such as the organization chart and the light department and so forth. We might want to take a look at this. In all of the six performance categories, from 2019 to 2020, we were rated the same. So where we were very strong then, we're very strong now. We were adequate then, we're adequate now, except for one. And that was in debt and contingent liability profile, where we went from strong in 2019 to adequate in 2020. And it seems like the biggest concern that Bond Council has is the decline in the percentage of uh, funding for our, one, uh, for our retirement um, uh, plan where we went from 84% down to 77, and that seems odd to me, Mr. Mizuko. I, I don't ever recall being at 84, but but uh, perhaps we should take a look at. And also, they they're definitely concerned long term about OPEB, other post employment benefits. So I think maybe one of the things we do now, since we have the muscle on the uh, budget an analysis side, is is uh, is include this in the list of things we want to take a more global look at how we handle our debt and how we maintain a stable double A plus rating and perhaps uh, get ourselves in shape to improve to a triple A rating in the next decade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I think we can talk about that separate from uh, Ms. Hajar's uh, suggestion. Is there a formal motion by anyone to uh, authorize Mr. Hajar to pursue uh, the taxi business licensing and issue in town? So moved. So moved. Okay, we'll take a, anything further on that. We'll take a vote. Mr. Lane? Aye. Mr. Maloney? Aye. Mrs. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Ja? Aye. And the chair votes aye. It's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Ja, for taking on that. And if I can help you with any of the past information or history, I'd be more than happy to work with you on that. Uh, Thank, you. Mr. Well, Thank all of you. We have a lot on that. We have Mr. a lot. Mr. Maloney, you um, brought up another issue, which I think falls a little bit in line, but maybe an expansion of what we're planning to start doing next week. And you alluded to it yourself, looking at operations. You made some particular points we should look at. Uh, Mr. Manager, can you either incorporate those uh, into that discussion we have coming up or plan it for a separate discussion, but not let it disappear that we review that those comments? Well, Mr. Chairman, as the board knows, I'm always willing to discuss OPEB at a meeting at length. Um, but sure, we can. What we can do is <laughs> well, maybe, we'll leave, maybe we can leave that out. <laughs> oh, that's the fun. Uh, sure. So, I believe next week, the board, just in brief, the board's gonna we're gonna sort of look at a brief organizational SWOT and sort of where we're going and some of the challenges with our organizational structure. Mr. Jared wanted to take a look at that. 
Uh, following that up, we'll look at the light department finances in sort of a global picture. And then after that, we can take a look at, in brief, I can get into as much detail as you want, sort of OPEB and how we get there with OPEB and what is our debt profile going to look like over the next few years. And uh, there's a couple things as it relates to water, sewer, and light and OPEB that we can look at in terms of how we get to where we want to be. So if we're looking at the next three meetings, we can probably knock one of these out each three, um, each of the three next meetings. Okay. So uh, you're working that in between uh, analyzing applications and what have you. So we'll see you Saturday morning, Sunday morning and with the lights burning. <laughs> yeah, no different than uh, usual. I, I tried to work this past Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to take Monday off, and that didn't really work. So, all right. Is there any other new business, Mrs. Donahue? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, as I talked to you earlier, I measured the big table in the Slackman's office. It's 12 feet long. The table opposite is nine feet long. It would be good if we could put three people on the big table that would be six feet apart and two on the other table so we could get back in one room so we could conduct our meetings in a nice way. Well, we could consider that. We'll talk with the health people and everything else having to do with their recommendations, and we'll see what happens there. All Thank right. You. Mr. Maloney? You know, just, I, I think we have to uh, find the elevator uh, work is going to be completed uh, before we do that. It shouldn't be much longer, I don't think, right? Right. Uh, at, the, at the moment, the elevator is still out, and the did the tower get working tonight, the air conditioner? So uh, in reverse order, the elevator will be up somewhere between August 1st and Labor Day, uh, but progress is going ongoing. The cooling tower arrives tomorrow morning and the air conditioning should be running <laughs> by close of business tomorrow. And we believe the phone system will be fully up and running. Uh, as we continue to let everyone know, Town Hall is aging and not so gracefully. Um, the building's kind of a disaster. We also have some rooms on the ground floor that experience some flooding that uh, we currently can't use, which is also part of our return to work plan to create temporary workstations in there. But little by little, it is getting better. Work is ongoing and we think the air conditioning will be working tomorrow. All right, so if nothing else, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Set made and seconded, Mr. Lane. Mr. Aye. Maloney. Mrs. Aye. Donahue. Aye. Mr. Ja. Aye. And the chair votes aye, that's unanimous. Thank you very much for your time this evening. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.